Hello. One of the many benefits that we've had since being in Ireland is had the opportunity to meet um, several new people and been invited into their homes. Um, one of the people we've been able to meet is uh, Catherine Kurtz. This is one of her books. And uh, we've been invited to her home, and she has agreed to do a reading for us today. From, is this from your new work that's uh, coming out in May? Yeah, this is the Next Adept book, which is the Scottish Detective series that I've been doing with Deborah Turner Harris over the last two or three years. Oh, and so great. this is the Templar treasure, and uh, it ought to be a lot of fun. Well, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for letting us come into your home and kind of invade and take pictures and, and doing this for you. I know this has been kind of on the on spontaneous and kind of, by the way, since we're here, could you please do this for us? And we do appreciate it. Oh, well, you're very welcome. You and Scott have been very gracious and gave us tea and biscuits and everything. It's been really nice. So Well, we, we like to have people come and visit us because while it's delightful living in Ireland, sometimes we do get a little lonesome. And uh, it's nice to have a break from the hours behind the, uh, the computer screen. <laughs> Well, great. Well, if you'd like to go ahead and do the reading for us, it'd be... Uh, <coughs> okay, um, to give you some background, because I'm not going to start at the beginning, I'm going to read you a scene from sort of the first fourth of the book. Um, there is a, a reincarnation theme that runs through the Adept series, uh, for those who are not aware of this particular series. And the main character, Adam Sinclair, is a psychiatrist who is also a, a mystic and, and uh, a psychic magician. Mm -hmm. And he solves some of his medical cases as well as police cases by using his, his psychic abilities. And uh, one of his partners is a young portrait artist who can sometimes paint people's pasts and occasionally their futures, and this is how he and Adam met, because oh. one of his patrons, a, a wealthy patron, died, and he had foreseen her death. He had seen it when he was painting her portrait, and so got caught up in, oh God, did I somehow cause it? And so Adam has taught him how to use this <coughs> as the gift that it is, and he has learned to use it in a forensic capacity, working with the third member of the team, who is uh, Noel McLeod, who is a, a uh, police inspector in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and most <laughs> of the action takes place in Edinburgh. Uh, this particular story touches on the background of Bonnie Dundee, John Graham of Claverhouse, <coughs> and they are trying to make a connection, possibly, with the spirit of Bonnie Dundee, and so they have gone to the place where his body is buried, and they are hoping that being there near where his physical body mm -hmm. ended up, that this will enable them to establish the psychic link that they need to somehow make contact with Dundee to get the information that they need about a mysterious seal that has been stolen, which has connections with the Knights Templar. Now, they're not ex sure, exactly sure where this connection is, how it comes about, but they're trying to find out. And so they have gone um, out to where, where uh, he is buried. Reclaiming the car from the car park, they set off along a narrow wooded back road pointing them in the direction of the old factor's house in St. Bride's Kirk, the latter now a ruin. The shadows were indeed lengthening as they parked again and entered the old churchyard. A few other visitors were inspecting gravestones farther across the yard, but they seemed engrossed in their own activities. As Peregrine followed Adam and MacLeod out across the grass among the grave markers, this time carrying his sketch box, he was suddenly conscious of a subtle prickling in his senses and the distinct feeling, absent at the castle, that he now was on the right track. His heart beat quickened as they wound through the burial ground and approached the western front of what remained of the little church, a lichen-studded enclosure open to the sky. Ducking through the round arched doorway, they made their way along the narrow line of paving slabs set where the center aisle had been, heading for a memorial plaque mounted on one of the stones to the right, just before a doorway leading out to the yard to the south. Here's the memorial marker, Adam said, checking his stride and pointing to the stone with its chiseled inscription. The actual barrier, burial would have been in the crypt below here. He indicated a steel trap door set into the paving just before it, closed with a heavy padlock. Peregrine glanced at the trap door, then turned his gaze to the stone plaque, reading it aloud as an exercise to begin focusing his attention. Within the vault beneath are interred the remains of John Graham of Claverhouse, Viscount Dundee, who fell at the Battle of Killiecrankie, 
27th July, 1689, aged 46. This memorial is placed here by John, 7th Duke of Athol, K.T., 1889. Peregrine glanced at Adam. Was he really 46? I always thought he was younger than that. Actually, the most recent scholarship suggests that he was born in the summer of 1648, Adam replied. That would have made him just 41. Nodding, Peregrine swept his gaze around the chapel, returning finally to the trap door at his feet. This is about as close as you're going to get, I think, Adam said. Go ahead and get yourself set up and we'll see what you can see. Noel, why don't you fend off in interruptions, at least until he gets started? As McLeod retreated wordlessly up the aisle, Peregrine handed his sketch box to Adam and opened it to take out a drawing pad and the book containing the Kneller portrait of Dundee. There was a low rounded stone like part of the top of a tombstone set against the wall under the memorial plaque, and Peregrine sat on it gingerly, facing the trap door that led down into the crypt, as Adam set the sketch box on end beside him and crouched down alongside. After opening the art book to the appropriate page, Peregrine balanced it across his knees and turned to a fresh sheet in his drawing pad, situating that on the opposite page as he groped in an inner pocket of his leather jacket for a favorite pencil. Ready when you are, he said, glancing up at Adam. All right, we'll do this a little differently from what we usually do, Adam said quietly. You're going to use the portrait as a focus to help you zero in on Dundee's connection with this place. Fix your gaze on the portrait and tell me what you see as you gradually let your focus move through the image. Peregrine drew a deep breath, shifting into the floating twilight of light trance. I see a man standing in the midst of a dark forest, he murmured softly after a few seconds. His name is John Graham of Claverhouse, Viscount Dundee. He's arrayed like a gentleman soldier in armor and lace, and his face is bright against the shadows. As he spoke, he felt Adam's light touch on his brow. He took another sighing breath and felt normal waking perceptions recede, leaving him alone with the image of Claverhouse, Dark John of the Battles. Dark is the wood through which you must travel, came Adam's quiet voice, softly sing-song in his ears. Bright is the face of the man you seek there. Enter the wood where he stands waiting. His face shines before you like a beacon, drawing you to him amid the shades of his own lifetime. A landscape of shadows took hazy shape before Peregrine's entranced vision. Anchored by Adam's voice and the sense of his presence, the young artist let his perception move tentatively forward among the shadows. As he did so, the shapes before him sharpened and clarified. He was still surrounded by the stones of St. Bride's Kirk, but the scene was of another age. The burial vault gaped open. Beyond it, a small group of armored men holding torches stood clustered around a rough wooden coffin resting on two wooden hurdles. Several tartan plaids had been spread in the coffin to receive the body, spilling over its edges, and Peregrine felt his gaze drawn to the figure laid out within their woolen folds. The pale, still face was very like the one in the Neller portrait, but it retained yet the suggestion of the dashing younger Dundee of the Melville de depiction. The lace at his throat harked back to both paintings, and the dark hair had been carefully arranged in curling ringlets on his shoulders and chest. He was wearing in death the same buff cavalry jacket and thigh-high leather boots described in eyewitness accounts of the battle at Killycrankie. In the dancing torchlight, Peregrine could clearly see the dark rust-red stain and ragged hole marring the jacket on the dead man's lower left side to show where he had taken his death wound. Two hands breadths within the area the breastplate would have covered. Without consciously willing it, Peregrine's hand began sketching what his deep sight reported. The faces of the mourners meant little to him, but his reading of the accounts of the burial suggested identities for several of those presents. present. One of them, a well-favored man in cavalry buff like Dundee himself, Peregrine judged to be the brave and loyal Earl of Dunfermline, James Seton, who had been one of Dundee's staunchest supporters and closest friends. <clears throat> Another, he supposed to be Lord Murray's factor, Patrick Stewart of Balakin, in whose house the body had lain before bringing it here. The one whose identity was little in question, both by his resemblance to the dead man and the depth of his grief, was David Graham, the brother of Dundee. Graham was openly weeping, his lean face wet with unregarded tears. But what drew Peregrine like a magnet was something clenched tightly in Graham's right hand, something small and bright that winked crimson as he brought the closed fist to his lips and pressed a kiss to what lay enclosed within. Pencil poised to draw what he was seeing, Peregrine moved closer in spirit to see what the object might be. With a small thrill of excitement, he realized it was a red enameled cross, perhaps three inches in length and breadth, fixed to a sturdy gold chain. Even as another part of his mind registered this discovery, his hand moving to sketch it, his trance self watched raptly to see what would happen next. As the mourners began to draw the plaids over the body, 
preparatory to closing the coffin and transferring it to the vault, the Earl of Dunfermline abruptly signaled a delay. His look of grief was almost as poignant as that of the dead man's brother. Taking a small, sharp blade from a sheath at his wrist, Dunfermline bent down and reverently cut away a long, curling lock of the dead man's hair. He wrapped it in a silken handkerchief as he nodded to the others to proceed and slipped it inside the breast of his buff jacket as he watched them lower the coffin into the crypt. As the coffin disappeared from sight, Peregrine's view of the scene blurred and dissolved into obscurity. His hand kept sketching automatically for several minutes, finishing what he had started. But as it finally became motionless, his pencil merely poised over the paper, he found himself drifting in temporary limbo. It seemed like too much effort to do anything about it. After a few more seconds, he heard Adam's voice softly calling to him as if from a great distance. Obedient to the summons, he took flight out of the depths of vision, winging upward in slow spirals toward the threshold of awakening. As he surfaced, he felt Adam's strong fingers grip his wrist briefly in a touch that signaled his release from trance state. With a sigh like a sleeper awakening, he gave himself a slight shake and blinked. So you've, you've got two elements there of what they're looking for. They already know about this red Templar cross, which is a Templar cross that uh, Dundee was reported to have been wearing when he fell at the Battle of Killiecrankie, and you've got this lock of hair. Well, they're going to try to track down this cross, which ends up to be in the keeping of another John Graham that you've met in Lamas Night, oh. a very old John Graham who's oh, now wow. in his late 90s, and they're going to go and visit him to find out what he knows about the cross, and they will work with him in a merged magical tradition of the two groups. So I, I had a oh, great is, deal of fun pulling yeah. the old John Graham back. Oh, this back. is great. This is great. It's <laughs> exciting. Again, the name of the book. The name of the book is <laughs> Adept Three: The Templar Treasure. And it'll be out in May, is in that May, correct? In May, yes, from Ace. Great. And well, we're working on number four, oh. and number five is in here. <laughs> well, that, that helps. That's good. Thank you very much again for doing this for you. We really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, but before we leave, could you introduce your cats? I know everybody in everybody watching this is going, who are the cats? Tell us about your cats. This is Bear, and Bear is our California cat. He came with us when we moved here in 1986. He was just a young sprat of about six. And uh, he's getting to be an elderly gentleman now, but he went through his six months quarantine. Uh. In the slams, he came home our first Christmas Eve that we were in Ireland, so it was a nice Christmas present for us. And he's just an old sweetie. He, oh, he's yeah. my oh, boy. Yeah, that's good. I like that. <laughs> and then this guy is Hero. And Hero came in through the cat flap and stayed. Oh. I was at a convention in the States, and Scott came home from fencing one night and tossed his <laughs> way. <laughs> tossed his fencing bag on the bed without turning on the light, then turned on the light, and here's this black and white cat on the bed right next to where he had flung the, the bag and just looked up to say, oh, hello, I live here now. And, and the reason he's named Hero is because when he first came, we referred to him as the visitor cat, and that got shortened to VC. And someone who wins the Victoria Cross, the VC, is a hero. So that's how well, he became a hero. Again, and thanks a lot. Hi, Hero.